Hello and welcome. Today we have a great special guest. Uh, our speaker uh, is an, probably the longest uh, Chisel only user. Uh, many of our original Chisel users were Chisel users slash developers. And I think by being a user, it's actually a better perspective because that gives them more understanding of how the user thinks rather than knowing how tool works inside and knowing how to code around bugs in the tools. And so our speaker uh, received an undergraduate degree from MIT as well as a master's degree and then their PhD from Berkeley and which point their course were started their career using Chisel, at which point they then uh, went on to Esperanto, including working with people like Jose, who's also on this call, and are now currently at Intel. And so with that, I'm excited to hear what Chris has to say. Take it away. Uh, thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, if you guys have questions, uh, either feel free to speak up or I guess type in whatever chat program you guys have. And Scott, feel free to interrupt me uh, for any sort of questions or clarifications. Um, you know, I have kind of a grab bag of slides and you know i guess part of this is what's interesting to you guys i don't i don't know um but i figured i'd talk about um uh what i spent my grad um uh school efforts on which was building uh an out of order core uh and this was done in chisel and uh, talking about maybe a little bit about my experiences and what i built and kind of what it enabled uh and it did culminate uh in a tape out which is uh the chip and and this uh front of this slide Oh, come on. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I was at Berkeley um, at the same time as Scott, uh, sharing a cubicle. And uh, it's hard to say exactly what I did. I guess I spent my time building an out-of-order core and chisel. And I guess the excuse was that uh, we were looking at kind of exploring different RTL-based research methodologies. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about kind of what the current state of the art is. Um, and how we were hoping that maybe by doing RTL, we could maybe do better research. Um, and once I finished with that, I went to a startup called Esperanto in Mountain View. And for that, we're building uh, a thousand core chip. And so you can see a little picture of it in the corner where those tiles are actually neighborhoods of 34 cores each. Um, and then uh, the, there's like a thousand minion cores uh, that are RISC-5 cores uh, written in Verilog. And then uh, we also uh, provided uh, four Maxion out of order cores that were in Chisel. So that was kind of a cool little duality experiment to kind of see, um, you know, the, the minion cores were like very, you know, handcrafted and custom low power, um, you know, for like machine learning type stuff. And then we had like our synthesizable, you know, Chisel out of order core for like control types of applications. And uh, looking forward to a hot chips talk from uh, the founder, Dave Ditzel, that'll be uh, August timeframe. And uh, once I finished that up, um, I uh, went to Intel uh, and there I'm still building out of order cores, uh, not in Chisel this time, um, but having a lot of fun building some, some new stuff there. So um, I don't know what everyone's uh, background in, in architecture is. I guess the class doesn't necessarily require it, um, but modern processors are very complicated. Uh, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, a single instruction takes a long time to execute. So we pipeline things. So each little box is another stage that these things march down. And we don't just want to do one thing, you know, at a stage, we'll have multiple instructions going at a time. Uh, and then of course, we don't want to really wait on, you know, the dependency as specified by the program. We'll just execute these as kind of a data flow order. So you end up with something that's, that's pretty complicated. Uh, and there's a lot of parts going on. There's lots of queues and decoupling and memories and SRAMs and register files and uh, plenty of ways for this to go wrong. Um, and this is, I think even this is only like a 10 year old processor and they just continue to get bigger and bigger and, and more complex. Um, and when I told my parents that I was building this thing called the Berkeley out of water machine, they were very confused why I would um, tell everyone that it doesn't work. Um, so I realized sometimes our terminology in our, in our field doesn't quite extrapolate to other places. Um, so there's no such thing as a best processor, um, for better or worse. Uh, you kind of always have to trade off. If you want more performance, it, it, it costs you something. Maybe it's area or power or actual, you know, money cost. Um, and so what we can do is we can actually like take different processor designs and we can throw them down and we can actually get, uh, effectively a curve that I've colored in red of uh, a whole line of best processors. And so in this case, this is some data that we collected from um, our out of order core generator, where we could actually change parameters 
And we could change, you know, is it a one wide processor? Is it a two wide processor? Is it a four wide processor? And we could kind of choose kind of the area and the performance that we wanted. Uh, and that's always really cool because we're always designing with constraints. And if you can write your code in a way that gives you the freedom and the flexibility to, to late select, to, to kind of choose near the end of the project, that's always like a real benefit. Especially maybe if like you're doing a multi-core thing or something, you know, the, the trade-offs, um, like sometimes you just don't know until you build it what's actually going to be the best. Uh, so it's nice to have a generator um, that lets us kind of explore these, these design points. Um, if you look at industry cores, uh, these are, I think, kind of what the best cores were out of ARM um, over time. And, you know, they don't settle in on a, on a design. It, they continue to evolve and change and grow. And sometimes it gets longer, sometimes it gets shorter. Um, so, you know, it's, it's nice if you don't have to write everything from scratch or if you don't have to, you know, commit to a design and, and then stick with it the whole way through. So it'd be great, you know, if, if we as, as, as academics could write RTL that lets us explore these different designs. Um, so kind of, you know, maybe trying to mimic something like this would be nice. Um, so now let me talk about what uh, it is that I built. Uh, so this is Boom, the Berkeley out of order machine. Um, it's out of order, super scalar. Uh, this implements the RISC-V ISA. Um, at the time that I worked on it, it did uh, the general purpose RV64G ISA. Uh, there's a new generation of Berkeley students that have expanded it and made it you know, better than what I did. Uh, it does boot Linux, so you can run real applications on it. And it's synthesizable. And what I mean by that is it's, is it's chisel code that goes to Verilog, and then you can bring this down to a sea of gates and stuff. Um, it's not like full custom. I'm not like drawing polygons or anything. Uh, not doing anything too crazy, uh, but it's not a simulation. It's a real synthesizable design. Uh, and it is open source, so people can download it, play around with it, improve it, um, try and break it, submit patches or something. Um, and thankfully, it wasn't that many lines of code. I think I've heard somewhere that uh, a programmer can hold about 10,000 lines of code easily in their head. Uh, and then you really need to start relying on hierarchies. Um, other designs are like hundreds of thousands of lines of code. So. Pretty glad that this was something that you could hold all in your head. Um, and it is parameterizable, so we can kind of change out the widths and, and, and different uh, parameters of it. Uh, and to make this kind of real, or to make this easier to make it real, this was kind of built on top of an existing library uh, called the Rocket Ship SOC. Uh, and one thing I think it's kind of cool from this uh, die photo, I don't know how to use a mouse, but um, in the middle, you see the IRF, that's the integer register file, and that looks very nice and structured. And in the right, in yellow, you see the FRF, the floating point register file. And that was completely synthesized. So that was just telling the tool, I want like three read ports and like two write ports, just do something. And it kind of did that. And the IRF, we needed a lot more ports uh, for the integer side. I think it was like six read and three write. And so my lab mate, Pfang, actually for that part did lay out things uh, kind of by hand in the physical design. So you can kind of see the difference between like a human layout and a machine generated layout. And they're about the same size, but the IRF is a lot more ports and a lot more registers. Um, so I have some slides to talk about why we had to do that, but sometimes it is nice to kind of kick in and, and customize the little things here and there. So this is the final product uh, of, of, you know, uh, of uh, the project for me. Um, Really, my contribution was to just provide an address generator. Um, the real researcher here was Pfang. Um, she was studying SRAM resiliency techniques. So, you know, these big structured things that you see, these are SRAM memories. Um, and they're basically like analog magic that you can store things to. And the problem is, is that they don't like to, uh, you know, they don't like the voltage to get lowered too much. Um, and so the, the lower you can lower the voltage, the more power you can save. And so SRAMs are annoying that they kind of limit your ability to lower the power, just uh, to lower the voltage to save power. So PFANG had a lot of cool ideas to make, uh, allow us to lower the SRAM voltage, uh, but the error rates go like crazy. So she had some resiliency techniques and they were all written chisel as, as I recall. Um, so no crazy like circuit tricks. This was, you know, kind of the microarchitecture level, uh, but she needed an address generator. So. I got to tag along as this complicated out of order core that was really just trying to poke the SRAMs and see when they fail or, 
or see when they're doing good. Um, but that was that was a really cool project. And uh, this was a TSMC 20 nanometer high performance mobile. Six millimeter squared is like really, really tiny. But I guess that makes it nice for you know cheap shuttle runs. Um, and we were able to get it to run at one gigahertz without crashing. <laughs> Uh, so that was a good milestone to hit. So I guess to go back to the beginning, how do you actually make an out-of-order processor? Um, and this is kind of glib, but it really is good advice. Um, well, it's, for one, I don't like Verilog. Uh, I find it got in the way and it added too many errors, uh, at least as a, as a student trying to write Verilog. And I think even moving the industry, I see tons of errors that get made that don't need to get made. So for us, it was, let's start with a new construction language, in this case, Chisel. Um, that lets us really, you know, generate what we want it to generate. The second one that's kind of glib but true is just start with a working processor. Uh, writing something from scratch is really, really hard. There's a lot of really unglamorous things like page table walkers and floating point units and devices and drivers and off chip interfaces. Uh, it's nice if you don't have to do any of that yourself. Um, so I like to think of this as like if someone asks you how to you make chocolate chip cookies, well, step one, just start with a cookie. And then step two, add like your little bits of chocolate chip, and then you take credit for the whole thing. Uh, so that was my strategy here. Um, so I have a bit of a timeline here. Um, so to be fair, during my grad student career, I was TAing and I was working on other things and some papers would distract me. So it's not like this actually took me a solid uh, five or six years of work, um, but I did start small. Uh, initially, I just wanted to know how do outer processors work out of order processors work. And so I just started writing stuff in Verilog to mostly just test kind of the renamer, the issue logic, uh, and see if I could understand it. And my excuse was that I wanted to um, pass the our, our qual exams, because uh, those, they would always ask us one question of like, how does an out of order processor work? And I wanted to get that question right. And the way that I started this is I just started with a, like a little single issue in order five stage core. and uh, as instructions finished executing the core, they passed the write back stage. I would then take that instruction and send it to my new pipeline. So essentially I was building a core that was always given non-speculative instructions. There was nothing that was misspeculated. There's no branch mispredicts. It was just testing a flow of perfectly predicted instructions. And so that let me build up a lot of infrastructure without worrying about a lot of other complexity. And so I did that for a few weeks and then I put that off to the side. Uh, and then when I was teaching a, a class, we had just created Chisel and thought, let's you know try to make our labs more interesting and start using Chisel in our labs. And so I decided to take some of our toy and order core uh, Chisel cores and start to grow it to be a more complicated out of order core. Uh, and again, this was like just single issue, integer only, like no caches, just memory accesses are magic. Uh, and just trying to cut out as much complexity as I could to focus on the part that was interesting. And then over time, I said, okay, maybe we should actually make this a real thing. And over time, you know, adding in superscaler, you know, maybe start making the back end, do more instructions, and then maybe adding support, build to fetch more instructions. Um, and, uh, you know, it slowly grew over time. Unfortunately, a lot of time was spent just fixing bugs and working on debug infrastructure. And, you know, that's just kind of the reality of building hardware is a lot of time is spent not on the interesting part, but on making it, making it work. Um, and, uh, eventually at the very, very end, as I was, I thought I was about to leave, then they're like, oh, let's do a tape out. Uh, and that's where things really kicked into high gear. Um, so as I said, uh, boom is, uh, a parameterized design. And so, um, here's kind of one way that we might structure this. So, um, in an out of order core, you have like this issue select logic where you decide which micro ops do you want to go? Um, and then once those issue, they have to read their operands from the register file. And there's some sort of maybe bypass network. So that way you can have back-to-back -back operations, you know, get their operands. And then you have some number of, of, of issue ports or execution units. And so in this case, what I've drawn here is um, like two different uh, issue uh, execution units. And they support different things. So one supports floating point and, and pipeline integer multiply. And uh, the other one has like a, an iterative divider. And so um, you know, you, you, I described the logic in these blocks and then I could just say, kind of parameterize, you know, I have some array of execution units and then just add a new execution unit that has these properties. 
And so to go from like, you know, a two wide processor to a four wide is like just adding two more lines of code. And of course, what's hidden underneath this is like all the library code and all the glue code and, um, you know, being able to say, okay, I have this many execution units, how many reports do they need? Okay, let's add those reports for your file. And so you can start to build off, you know, build this up. Um, but it, you know, it, it worked actually pretty well, um, you know, to, to try to formulate things in a way that you can kind of glue these things together and, and piece them together. And then it just takes a few lines of code to make a new thing. Um, so kind of as a point of comparison of parameterizability, um, I was looking at, um, there's not really much in the way of open source industry cores. Uh, this is maybe changing with RISC-V. Um, I know that there's, I think it's Alibaba has at least some claims of open sourcing something. Uh, maybe Jose has, has gone to touch it, I'm not sure. Um, but there's not really a whole lot out there. Uh, but there is the open Spark, which is um, uh, a multi-threaded, multi-core in order cores. Um, and this is a pretty serious chip, pretty big chip. And we can look at the code. So just to give you like a little bit of a glimpse, um, I like to look at the register file. And I don't know if you can see the very, very top of my screen uh, for the name of the register file, but it's basically like in into, you know, 273 by 78, you know, custom, you know, FRF. And it's like, oh my goodness. Like, and this is like a thousand lines of code for this specific instantiation. Uh, and there's no vectors. So you, you know, you have W1, W2, R1, R2. There's no bundle, so you have to rely on like the name prefix to say, oh, this is gonna be W1 bundle of adder, TID, valid bit. Um, and it's all hard-coded numbers. You can tell that some of this is auto-generated because like the tabs and the spaces are off and the code style is just all over the place. I think some of the scan stuff at the bottom just got like added in maybe with the tool, uh, but this is the source code that's online. And if you wanna play around with the, this core, this is what you're gonna be playing around with. Um, so that's, that's kind of ugly. Um, so this is what Boom's register file looks like. So we have a nice class called register file, no, no ugly names. And then we have a set of the parameters that you know, let us specify how many registers it has, how many reports and write ports, what the widths of those registers are. And then we can just generate different register files. So in fact, um, you know, we're using the same code for the floating point register file and the integer register file. And as I showed before from the uh, floor plan, you know, those had different reports, different write ports, um, and you know, different, you know, different outcomes. Uh, and then for the IO, we just have a nice little vec of some number of read ports and some number of write ports. Uh, and then we can bundle up um, you know, a register file report and that register file write port into you know, uh, first class citizen bundles. Uh, so this is really clean and allows us to make changes uh, pretty quick. So I was, I was very happy to use Chisel for stuff like this. Um, Here's a visualization demo of a two wide uh, boom core. So in the bottom is the reorder buffer. So essentially um, it's gonna look at the ROB head, which is in orange, and it's gonna see if those two instructions are, are still busy. And if they're not busy, then it's gonna commit them and move on to the next row. So it can commit two instructions at a time. And at the tail at the bottom of the ROB, it's gonna uh, dispatch and write in two new instructions. And, um, and yellow in the Bs, that's like the busy signal. So you can see as instructions start to free up, uh, the busy signal deasserts. Uh, and then in the middle are the issue slots. So in this case, it's gonna um, enqueue new instructions in the bottom of the issue slots. And then as the cycles go up, uh, the instructions are going to migrate upwards and they may also issue out of order. Uh, so let's see if this works. So. Uh, this is running CoreMark and it's crunching away at a nice uh, instructions per cycle of two. And uh, you can kind of see the instructions are issuing out of order. And in the ROB, they're finishing out of order, <clears throat> but they're finishing before the ROB had gets to them. So it's running at like full performance. And so this is all uh, printfs. <laughs> uh, for whatever reason, I found printfs were really, really productive for debugging. And I did a little bit of a trick here, which is I like to use Vim. And if you do like, you know, down a page in Vim, it moves a certain size. And so I actually, I size my terminal, I size the printf such that I'm basically holding down just next page and it basically turns it into a movie and people laugh. But because this is actually just a huge text file, you can grep it, you can search for uh, things, you can go forwards and backwards in time. Um, 
you know, if you have really good uh, waveform tools, uh, waveforms are pretty good. Um, but the problem with waveforms um, is they're good for like signals and protocols and looking at an interface, but they're very bad for something like this out of order core where you have lots of micro ops that are in data structures. And I want to know what does the data structure look like? Like what does the ROB actually look like? Um, so a common failure would be that for some reason the head of the ROB never got unbusy and it just like locked up. And so then I can like try to look at the, this and see like what was the last instruction I depended on and what was going on. So it turns out, at least for me, per nest are really awesome. Um, you know, when we were doing this work and, um, you know, the current kind of architecture research, uh, a lot of it's software simulation based. Uh, and there's a lot of advantages to using a software simulator in terms of kind of being able to quickly prototype something. Uh, I think it's useful for if you're trying to build something, a software simulator can help you make kind of an A or B decision. Like I need, I need to make a decision and it's between A or B. And I want to just simulate just enough to give me confidence to pick one or the other. Um, but trying to build something very complicated, like an entire processor, is, is really tough. You know, you have to cut corners, and it can be a bit hard to quantify how off you really are. Uh, it's also hard to get in information on like what is the energy of this software model. And you can try to build, you know, analytical models to some level of accuracy, but you still don't quite know how much you're missing. Uh, but the part that I really hate about software models is they don't run very fast. You know, they run on the order of, um, you know, depends on how detailed they are. You know, maybe if you're lucky and you're really, you're really, really good, maybe it's running at like one, you know, megahertz. Uh, but usually they're on the order of like tens of kilohertz. And so it can take you, you know, maybe 30 minutes or an hour to, you know, run a million instruction or a couple of million instructions. So when you're trying to like see how good is my processor on like spec, I can't run all of spec, that's 20 trillion instructions. So I have to very cleverly pick samples. And the concern is, is that I pick the right sample, uh, that I pick enough samples, um, am I weighting the samples correctly? Um, you know, and then the interaction across samples, like maybe some interaction is um, uh, like just an example of like a last level cache. If my last level cache is, I don't know, like eight megabytes, it may take a long time to fill that up and then another long time to overflow it and, and start to see kind of swap issues. So that's kind of an issue that we don't necessarily run uh, our simulations long enough. Um, something you see a little bit more of is people starting to write RTL of the specific part that they're analyzing and then maybe plugging that into a software model. So I think that's, that's pretty positive. And then if you have that RTL, you can start to try to get some power results, but usually with synthetic inputs. So, the attitude that we were doing at Berkeley, um, it's not just at Berkeley, of course, uh, but something that we, we enjoyed um, was, you know, start with the RTL of a processor system. Uh, that's a very big bullet point. <laughs> that's pretty hard. Uh, but if you have something like that or it's open source, uh, there's other universities open source their stuff. There's a few industry cores that are open source. If you can have RTL of a processor system, now we can put that onto an FPGA and now we can run it, you know, maybe tens, maybe even hundreds of megahertz. And that allows us to, uh, in let's say maybe six hours, get a trillion instructions. So now you could do uh, an entire spec run of 20 trillion instructions on the order of like a day or two, which is really pretty cool. And then because it's real RTL, you can actually try to build a power model from actual events in, in the actual design. Uh, and then of course you can run it through floor plans, you can get area and time reports. And so now your confidence interval on, your, on what you're actually researching is, is a lot tighter. Uh, so that's really, really cool stuff. Uh, and then, um, I, don't, I don't know if this means anything to you guys, but a petacycle, if you had a cluster of FPGAs and you're willing to wait like two weeks, you could actually do a whole petacycle, uh, which is like running through a whole suite of benchmarks and operating system stuff. And uh, that could allow you to maybe find bugs or could allow you to have a lot of confidence um, in your performance. Or if you have a generator, you could actually generate multiple different designs and you could spend your, your simulation resources trying out new design points. Um, so just to give an idea of what kind of interactions you can see at the kind of Terra level, um, this is some data from uh, one of our lab mates, Mark Damas, who's I think at Google Brain now. And he was looking at two minutes of a Java workload on top of Linux. And this is running on rocket ship. And he was interested in garbage collection and trying to accelerate garbage collection actions. And we also had a DRAM model that I think was software based, but was running 
inner FPGA infrastructure. And 120 seconds of simulated time is maybe like a day of simulation or it's a couple hours of simulation because uh, we're talking about tens of billions of, um, uh, like I think like a quarter of a trillion instructions here. And he's just looking at the DRAM row miss rate. And you could just see when a garbage collection phase started in green and the effect that that had on the application. And these aren't just even regular. So you can't just, you know, do a sample at the garbage collection point and a sample after. Like, you know, there's interesting interactions that live across these different phases. And so if you can do simulation work that will capture these phases, uh, then you can maybe get new, new results. Um, you know, speaking as, as a computer architect, we have lots of ideas to do all sorts of really cool stuff, uh, but we always have to justify it. And if our simulation methodology doesn't let us justify some new idea, then, then we can't do it. Uh, or we have to be very, very brave to put something in completely speculatively. Um, so, you know, these types of, of uh, you know, methodologies to evaluate an idea like that might attack, you know, garbage collection, being able to simulate on the order of, of minutes is really, really helpful. So one question, you know, that we're asked is, you know, okay, so you have this generator, but, you know, how agile can you really be with this? Um, and so what put this to the test is, you know, in April, we had a design that we called Boom version one. Um, and uh, then we decided, hey, let's tape this thing out. <clears throat> and, um, you know, before we would put, uh, we would like do timing reports and, and area reports um, that were using kind of educational libraries. And they weren't very accurate and they might report a critical path that might be a lot of work to fix. And if you don't have a tape out behind it, you may not be, feel justified to go and actually go and fix that, that timing path. Or you may not believe it because, you know, maybe your SRAM models aren't very good. So we finally sat down and said, okay, let's actually do a tape out. Here's actual TSMC libraries. And this has to like actually, actually work. And now we have the justification and the accuracy of the tools to really go and, and really clean this thing up. And so what we ended up with later, about three months later, was what we call Boom, boom version two. And so I'll, I'll go through a few of the places that we, we changed up the design. And it only took a, bit, a, a couple of weeks to change up each, each aspect. Um, <clears throat> let's see, so uh, one was in the front end design. So, um, you know, the idea here is we have to fetch instructions uh, from an instruction cache. And uh, we, in parallel to that, we have to access a branch predictor to see if we have any um, branches that we want to predict. And if so, where do we want to go? And so the branch predictor gets the results and we look at the instructions that come with the instruction cache. And we look to see if there's any branches uh, that we fetched and where they want to go. And then if we see a branch and the branch predictor says, let's take it, then we have to redirect the pipeline. So in red, I've, I've highlighted a very, very long path. Um, and so there's a couple of problems here. One is that we had to decode the instructions and there was multiple instructions. Uh, and then we had to look at our branch prediction output and make a decision. And then we had to go through a bunch of these um, uh, PC uh, select boxes to decide what the next address should be. But then to index the branch predictor, we also have to hash in some history. So like, this is just like really, really bad path. Um, and so, um, and then also we had a micro BTB that was, um, I think completely fully associative. So this is all, all kinds of bad. Uh, so we were able to come in here and started to put in registers to start to pipeline this better. And so we moved the hashing off to its own stage. Uh, we made the BTB, we put that into SRAM and then we made it set associative and partially tagged. Uh, so that way we could access um, the BTB much faster and we can make it much bigger. So we're actually getting more performance despite the fact that we've now added more delay to the processor. Um, and then we gave the, the branch predictor uh, its own stage, um, but because that pushed back the redirect a while, um, we now rely on the BTB to give us the redirection target. Um, and so we'll try to guess what we think the target is from the BTB to give ourselves uh, the early redirect and then we push back later checking if the actually verify if the output was right. Um, so all this kind of reconfiguration, you know, because of I think kind of the beauty of the chisel and the modularity, this really wasn't too hard to kind of just start throwing down registers and kind of move the stages that things happened in. And then we could get nice feedback from the, the synthesis results pretty quickly. The other thing that was really interesting was 
the register file. Um, so in Boom, we were storing both uh, floating point and integers in a single monolithic register file. And uh, to satisfy the performance that we needed, this ended up being like, uh, I think it was three issue. And that ended up coming out to be like seven reports and three write ports. And we wanted like 110 physical registers for our performance. And uh, this is like our first floor plan and it took up half of the area of the processor. And what you can't see is that all of the wires couldn't route. So they're just routing wires through wires. And so the tool just says, well, here's your thing, but it doesn't actually work. Don't, please don't tape it out. Um, and then also because this thing was taking up so much area, uh, just the RC delay to get from one side to the other also starts to become a critical path. Um, and so again, this is also like the design rule checks um, and, and the LVS stuff. Like this is just like, you can't tape this out. It's, it's just completely broken. Um, and so what we did is we did a couple things. We split the integer registers out of the floating point. So that way each register file could be a little bit smaller and they could be located a little bit closer to the units that wanted them. And we could reduce uh, the read ports a little bit uh, on the integer side. And the floating point didn't need nearly as many ports. So with the floating point register, three read, two write, we let that, we let the tool synthesize that and that ended up being very happy. With the integer though, we still needed to do a little bit more. And you know, this goes kind of below the chisel level now. In fact, it really kind of goes below the Verilog level. Um, I don't know how much I want to dwell on this, but basically, um, you know, chisel and Verilog is kind of on the right side of the RTL level where you just throw down a bunch of these, you know, bit cells and you just end up with too much wires trying to get to each little guy. Uh, and so in the middle, what we did is we actually um, by hand manually instantiated the individual gates that we wanted. Uh, and then we put a box around that and said, this is our unit, our, our, our handcrafted unit cell. Um, and then we, in Chisel, built a model, like a functional model of that unit cell. And so in Chisel, it'll generate, you know, everything that we want with a little black box for you to drop in your handcrafted little secret sauce. And then at the place tool, I think P thing had to go and tell it like, please break ladies out in rows. And that's kind of how we attack this problem of dealing with all of this wire congestion. So we had to go a little bit custom, but this is one of these parts of the processor that uh, companies still see value in, in adding some custom to it. Um, so I took some data on our four months of taping out and kind of marking the clock frequency that we were able to hit. And this is bad science. I changed all the parameters for every single data point. Uh, some of them are uh, at what we call the typical, typical corner. So that's gonna run faster where you assume that the transistors are all kind of typical. The SS is like the slow, slow, where you assume like really bad, you know, case scenarios with the transistors. So it's going to clock slower. Um, and we also changed uh, the leakage and the speed of our cells halfway through this adventure. So that's the RVT versus the LVT cells. So later what we ended up fabricating was 100% LVT cells, which is uh, very leaky, uh, but, but is a bit faster. Uh, but we were small enough so we could get away with that. And eventually in red is what we actually taped out. Uh, but also what this doesn't capture is a lot of these points are just not manufacturable. The tool is still complaining about wires crossing and shorting and all sorts of terrible things. So a lot of effort is just cleaning up the design and trying to you know, get rid of critical paths and stuff. Um, so I think um, you know, what I learned from this is hardware is hard and building a hardware design that works is really hard. And building a hardware design that is also performant uh, is really, really hard. And one that works and is performant is really, 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 really hard. And I don't know, like this is a hard problem uh, that, you know, I think industry is still trying to figure out is how do we make designs, you know, quickly and cheaply that are really high performance and also work um, and deliver everything with the features that people want. Um, so I can give a few pieces of advice. Um, but before I get into that, I was, you know, kind of my thoughts on, on agile hardware development. I think from this experience, I learned that writing the RTL and chisel, you can be very agile. It can feel a lot like software. And I was pretty happy, at least with my designs that I could parameterize boom to be very small. And 
um, at that small size, I could actually compile from Chisel to Verilog and then Verilog to C++ and then run through all of you know, our test suite <clears throat> on the order of about six minutes. So that was quick enough for me to like make a change. Oh, I wonder if this works and then see if it actually did something. And that made me pretty happy. That's pretty productive. Um, I also felt confident that Chisel does allow you to make these pretty quick and far reaching changes. You know, then you can decide, let's break out the register file or let's re-pipeline, you know, the, the branch prediction pipeline. Um, and, and that kind of just, you know, works. And I was pretty happy that, you know, with the generator approach, you know, you can make decisions later in the process. process. Uh, and it can be very hard because a lot of what you do is zero sum. I only have so much area, but I don't know who, who to give it to. And sometimes you just don't know until everything kind of comes together and gets debugged. Um, and in general, you could be agile so long as your changes don't affect the floor plan. Once you affect the floor plan, like now, now things get hard. So, you know, I do feel that the physical design aspect is a bottleneck. Um, it takes about, you know, in our case, three hours to get synthesis results. So that's, you know, going from the chisel to the Verilog and then going to gates, not necessarily located anywhere, but just telling you like how many gates are in your critical paths and giving you kind of an idea of, you know, do I need to do more work? And so, you know, I can maybe do a few experiments a day, but that's, that's kind of tough, especially if you have a generator and you want to try out different ideas. Um, also maybe, um, you know, this is a problem for some places, particularly like startups, but you only have so many licenses. And so you can also get bottlenecked and just how many licenses you have to play with. So it, it can be hard to, if this takes a lot of hours to synthesize the results, uh, I can't do a whole lot of studies that way. And then if you want actually placing and routing the design, then that could take, you know, on the order of a day uh, or even worse, you know, depending upon how serious the design is. Um, and as I showed with the register file example, there's still a little bit too much value that's provided with manual intervention that effectively there's still um, a lot of performance to be gained by going in and tweaking something. And once you do that kind of a tweak, that does cause you to lose your agility. So you have to be careful about when you want to make those calls. I also found just trying to read these synthesis re reports like really hard to reason about. And not, as, and, you know, what I want to do is I want to write a Python script to analyze this for me and like tell me what happened or tell me what the problem is. And then maybe even have the computer modify the generator parameters to like rerun a new result. And I would love to just throw this at a computer and then come back a week later and get like seven good designs. But unfortunately, it requires kind of too much designer knowledge to look at the report, then know where in the RTL to make a change and then see if that affects you know, the physical design later. So uh, this part was still, still pretty tough. Um, and then, as I said, verification is really hard. Uh, a lot of people are, are put on this type of task. And uh, I certainly found, especially with something as productive as chisels, I could, I could write bugs faster than I could find them. Uh, but at least with chisel, the bugs were much more interesting bugs. Uh, they were more conceptual than, you know, just something kind of silly. Um, you know, now how did I verify Boom? Um, I had a couple different techniques. Um, you know, none of them were, were silver bullets. Uh, one was uh, using kind of directed uh, assembly tests um, that, you know, were testing a specific, you know, behavior going after a specific bypass path you thought was risky. Uh, but then also having a randomized torture generator. So there's a few that are open source. Uh, Berkeley open source one of ours called Risky Torture. And we found that was pretty useful for finding all sorts of like weird, you know, interactions and cases that a compiler is gonna actually generate pretty boring code. Uh, so having a random torture tester for your hardware is, is, is nice. Um, let's see. You know, I, a big thing is uh, writing assertions in your code. You know, Chisel has assertions. It's a great idea to use them aggressively, uh, particularly at the interfaces that say like, when I write this module, I'm making a guarantee like that this is what I expect. And if I don't get what I expect, then we'll error out and we'll find it. And if you ever do formal, formal, some formal techniques, uh, rely on your assertions is kind of guidepost on, on exactly what's legal or not legal. So getting in the habit of writing lots and lots of assertions. I, like on the order of like one assertion for every 20 lines of code, every 50 lines of code, I think is maybe a, a good idea to try to stick to that. Um, and then the final thing that was really helpful for us, uh, if you can ever write a C++ functional model of your hardware, and then you can run them side by side, that can be really, really helpful. 
Um, and so, uh, for example, at Esperanto, we actually open sourced our ISA simulator, uh, derived in part from work that was done uh, by Jose at UCSC. Um, and in this case, you know, the out of order course spits out a commit log of instructions. And our Dramajo uh, C simulator is also running the same program and it's checking in lockstep. Uh, does it agree with the outcome? And part of what can get hard about this is if sometimes, let's say you read a performance counter. You know, you ask the hardware, how long did it take to run something? Well, Dermajo is just doing instruction by instruction. It doesn't have a concept of, of cycles. And so sometimes you'd have to let the hardware override, you know, your C++ model and the C++ model have to be able to take that and then make the change and keep going. So I thought that was maybe the most useful thing that we had. Um, you know, unit tests can also be helpful. In my case, I found it was too hard to think of a good unit test that could test um, the kind of complexity of these out of order pieces. Um, so I wasn't clever enough to figure out how to write an input generator to a unit test and then write like a golden model to say what's a valid output. Um, but if you can write unit tests, uh, you know, I recommend if you can. Um, so just to give an idea of one interesting bug that we found, uh, this was uh, thanks to an assertion error. Um, but the problem is that by default, assertions aren't synthesizable. Um, but we're running this spec benchmark 401 bzip2. And the assertion triggers half a trillion instruction, uh, half a trillion cycles in. So uh, software simulation is not going to find it. And the bug was actually pretty stupid. You know, you have like these jump instructions that have some offset, like 26 bits or something that's signed. And you have the address that you're currently at, and you figure out what the target is by, you know, adding these up together. And I guess uh, I did the sign extension improperly. And so I guess if I'm at a negative address and I have a negative offset, I guess I think maybe that was a scenario that would go wrong. Surprisingly, didn't come up in any other test. Uh, but we found this on the FPGA. If we had been running this in Verilator, it would have taken 39 years to get to 50 billion cycles. Um, what we did for this case is um, another one of my lab mates, uh, Dong Yu Kim, um, had be, uh, by using, I guess, the um, Fertile, which is, I guess, kind of the back end of Chisel, he actually wrote Fertile passes that would take these Chisel assertions and turn them into actual hardware constructs. So then you could actually continue to check your assertions on the FPGA. And if one triggered, it would pipe it up to the very top and give you an error. So it could tell you what assertion triggered. And so with this tool of his, we could actually find after running for a couple hours on the FPGA, uh, this specific assertion failure. Um, and there were some other crazy tricks that Don you had where he could actually stop the simulation and pull out all of the state. And then we could run it in um, a regular VCS simulation off, uh, off, not on the FPGA. So that way we could actually see what the waveform looked like. So it took a lot of crazy work to find this bug. Um, but uh, that's just kind of one, one bug of many that pop up. Um, so anyways, I think maybe with that, um, I'll uh, go to questions. Great talk, I'm just giving a solo applause. I'll let uh, people speak up for questions. Uh, okay, I think we have first one uh, coming in via chat. Asking for your printf debug setup, is there a way to specify the order of prints when they are located in different or nested modules? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the answer is unfortunately no. I guess I think they're ordered within the module, but not across modules. So I just had to tough through it the fact that they were going to be a different order. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that, that was definitely a complaint of mine. Um, but yeah, there's, I think, no good answer to that. Uh, if it, I'm, I'm thinking someone in maybe what change the tools, if I was to give you a field in the printf, which is a precedence, it would like rank by precedence per cycle. Would that be something you'd be, or that just quickly get out of, out of hand? So I think it's certainly, um, I think it's certainly possible to try to tag your printfs with like, uh, like a cycle count or something. And 
you could conceivably maybe write some scripting to reorder them in a way that's really helpful to you uh, after the fact. Um, well, well, I'm saying that on the, on the tools front, like as someone, you know, implements a fertile uh, simulator, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's not hard for me to recognize, you know, what printfs are going off on which cycles, right? That's not hard for me to figure out. Um, but like I said, I'm just trying to figure out the interface that's reasonable for developers. So for example, like I was saying, if you had another comma argument to your printf, it's a number that's like, hey, this is the number of precedents. And so I'll print them out in order of increasing precedence or something like that. Uh, or decreasing maybe makes more sense. I don't know. So you could say, oh, this is printf. And it's like, you know, here's my message and then comma 10 or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, it's definitely an interesting thing to look into. I mean, you know Fertile better than I do, Scott. So maybe you have some ideas on how to address it. Um, but yeah, I think I just learned to tough through the fact that it was going to be out of order across modules. And I could see an argument maybe made to add some, add a little bit of tags to the printf string itself so I could post process it. Um, I know we did like, a, we did a commit log for an in order core. And the problem with that is that a standard in order core often does the write backs out of order in fact. Uh, and so it means that the commit log, um, you don't actually have the, the data in order. And so um, what we did is, yeah, we, we added some tagging in a post-processing script to reorder the print app so it looked like what we wanted it to look like. Yeah. Oh, well. Cool. Uh, it seems we have another question coming in via chat. Uh, does Chisel have good support for the black box optimized gates? you had to use or is it a tricky amount of input uh, or sorry, was that tricky to input into the design? Yeah, um, let me see if, uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah, so it's not all that hard to write a black box um, in Chisel um, and there's quite a few uses for it. Sometimes you might wanna hide some C++ hooks uh, to maybe like an external simulator in, in your black box. And you can also parameterize your black box. Um, so another thing that we use black boxes for were like cover points. So we wanted to be able to optionally turn on the black box to kick into validation code that wants to know, was this signal ever like covered? So that way they can build some sort of confidence. So um, there's some good tutorials on black boxes on the, uh, on the Chisel Wiki. So, so creating a black box wasn't too hard. Um, and then it wasn't, you know, uh, it wasn't all that hard to write a little Verilog snippet that would be what the black box would, what that would replace that black box. So that part wasn't hard. The part that scared me was um, you're taping out something that is going to be using this black box. It's it's a handcrafted thing uh, that goes into the black box. Uh, but when I'm normally simulating my chisel code. Um, I need something to go into that black box. Um, and so what I did is I wrote chisel code um, that to my best knowledge exactly matched what the gates did that we had specified. And so I had a flag to turn off, use black box or use my handcraft version because the, in, the interface of this black box is very different than a typical you know, chisel register file. Like now I was really mucking with like the write enable bit and the, the you know, like the, 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 the output enable bits. And so I had to refactor my chisel code to, to interface with the black boxes I wanted. And then I wanted to make sure that I simulated um, that, you know, in chisel running very fast. And, um, and then separately, we would uh, do the one with the black box with the gate level handcrafted. We, we simulated that at the gate level, but the gate level runs at like, I don't know, maybe 10 Hertz. Like it runs really, really slow. And so it's like, well, does my thing still boot Linux? Like, oh, I don't know because I can't run it. I, th I think we actually ran booting Linux for like three days at the gate level just to make ourselves like, oh, phew, at least we didn't mess that up. Uh, but there was this concern of, does my chisel version of what I think goes in the black box match exactly our handcrafted gate level thing? And that's a problem in industry too, uh, where they'll use, um, uh, I believe they'll use, use tools like LEC to do like um, uh, basically like theory proof that they're equivalent. Um, and in our case, we didn't do that, but we at least tried to simulate both sides 
to make sure that we got it right. But that was the scariest part was, you know, making black boxes is easy. It can be annoying in this case because the black box is so low level that I can't use Verilator. It's, 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 it's like at the gate level. So I had to do a gate level simulation. So that made me scared that I could have a bug uh, and that they may be different. So that, that was, I think, the scary part. But the actual mechanic mechanisms of doing it was not, was not that hard. Yeah, I, I've had similar experiences. Uh, fortunately, I think there's some development effort. I don't want to speak for other people, but I believe uh, making these unifying IRs to make it easier to have fewer things be black box and chisel, right? So the idea being that mm. you can bring it into that, that world. Now it's all in one language. It's not opaque, and you can hopefully see that. Uh, yeah, I definitely uh, had an experience in grad school uh, similar to what you're describing, where we had a design, it worked great in simulation, and then... Um, post synthesis gate level simulation it did not work and lots and lots of hair pulling later it was determined that just the same thing we're describing where there's a model for the gate in our tail simulation there's a model for the gate in gate level simulation the there's a bug in education library from synopsis <laughs> about the, how the gate was supposed to behave and like oh my gosh like that took so long to find and um yeah so yeah what's driving multiple representations of the same circuit it's a verification uh Nightmare. Uh, okay. Oh, so we have another question coming in. Um, did your designs incorporate a lot of inheritance through out-of-order programming? I feel like thinking about this during design process is less agile for me personally. <clears throat> so I think the biggest thing that I, I definitely relied on object-oriented programming like crazy. Uh, I think being able to describe, um, I don't think I have good slides set up for this. Uh, but just to describe like execution units and function units, I relied heavily on object-oriented in class hierarchies. Um, and basically I'd have like an FPU class and that would describe different types of FPU things, like a single precision floating point, to double precision, uh, you know, a floating point, you know, to floating point conversion unit. And so I could hide a lot of the shared common code in the super class and, 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 uh, other parts of the pipeline would know how to talk to an abstract FPU and they would know, I need to ask it how many read ports it wants. You know, I know that the FPU wants like some condition code flags. So I know how to like route to that. So that was super helpful for me to think about uh, class hierarchies. Um, so that, that was pretty nice. I think also with the BPU we used, um, you know, there's parts, uh, you know, typical branch predictors have some sort of global history that they want to track as they run through the program, but there's you know a million different algorithms for what to do with that. And so I, I did find it helpful to have abstract BPU classes and the abstract class would hold the shared code for like global history stuff and being able to like reset or snapshot and you know roll back history. But then a subclass would actually provide a specific algorithm uh, implementation. So I thought that that was useful to, for kind of code reuse to shove a lot of the shared stuff into a superclass. Uh, so that was pretty nice. I think my favorite part was just the, you know, the interface to, you know, uh, providing an input parameter so I could parameterize the class. Uh, I think that was really helpful. Great. Yeah, we had a, a, a segment on inheritance. We didn't go as far in this course. We didn't talk about the cake pattern or um, diplomacy. Uh, uh, but I... But we, we, we definitely did, you know, abstract classes, case classes, and, you know, simple concrete inheritance. And I think that's definitely pretty helpful. Yeah, I never got super happy with how to, I guess, do parameter injection, I guess is maybe the right term. Uh, for most of the boom code, I just had a global class that would pull in a lot of parameters that were really cross-cutting. Something like, what is your excellent? Like, what is the is this a 32-bit processor or a 64-bit processor? I didn't really want to pass that around. So that was kind of global. And there's this tension between, you know, the code being nice or clean and being understandable by anyone else. Um, and yeah, some of the, yeah, Scala can get pretty crazy. And I mostly just kind of stuck to global classes and try to keep it in one place. So that way anyone would know where to go to find the global stuff. Um, and I try to stay away from implicits, uh, but, but this stuff is hard. You know, there's a lot of stuff that is, is pretty global. Yeah, yeah, implicits, I also have a similar uh, judiciousness uh, fear. 
Um, we have another question coming in. Uh, you've been a large company in the last few years. How has that changed your view of agile hardware? A any new feedback or perspectives? Um, I mean, hardware is hard. Uh, I, I think I, I was pretty proud that I think we were able to accomplish a lot at a startup with a very, very small team. Um, you know, almost all of our time was spent on post-silicon debug type stuff on, on kind of reliability and debugability after the fact. We, um, you know, didn't spend, you know, nearly as much time as uh, on just adding like brand new performance features. Um, but I think, I think it was nice that we could do a lot with a small team. Um, but it's hard building really big and complicated stuff takes a lot of people, even hardware startups, you know, are not super small. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, that's a hard question to answer. It's hard to say that with the complexity and the size of, of what big companies are doing, it's hard to tell them we'll just do it with fewer people, um, especially because a lot of, I mean, to some degree, you know, it feels like the teams could be, you know, like even it feels like the teams still feel kind of small, even at a big company. Um, and a lot of manpower comes to stuff like the ver verification, validation, uh, you know, um, stuff that's a bit easier to farm out. Uh, that's kind of beyond the RTL problem. Uh, so I think Chisel solves the RTL problem really well. I think we still need to figure out together like how to make the verification part easier. And I think until we figure out how to really make the verification part easier, I think companies are still going to you know want big teams. Um, it is nice though if if a small group of people can hold the whole design in their head. Um, I think that's one challenge when you're building something that's really big and really complicated is communicating you know all of the things that are going on across the whole team. 